Um, I'd like to reconvene the meeting from closed session and call this meeting to order for the City Council meeting of March 2nd, 2022. Uh, Council Member Escobedo is participating via teleconference. Madam Clerk, can you please call the roll? Madam Mayor, Council Members, <clears throat> excuse me, before I ask for a roll, I would like to announce that um, a telephone call-in option was published on the agenda and available tonight for general public comment and the redistricting public hearing. Those calls will be transferred to me uh, when they are available and is appropriate uh, to hear those comments. I'll accept roll call now. Councilmember Cordero. Here. Councilmember Escobedo. Let's see if he's gonna unmute himself. I can see him online here with us. <laughs> <laughs> we trust you. Um, uh, Councilmember Soto. Here. Councilmember Waterfield. Present. Madam Mayor Patino. Here. City Attorney, Mr. Watson, would you please give us the closed session report? To work. Madam Mayor, uh, pursuant to the uh, outstanding or the um, published agenda, instructions were provided to the agency representative, Mr. Stillwell. I know further comment needs to be made. Thank you. First item this evening is a proclamation and Council Member Soto will, will be making the presentation. Thank you, Madam Mayor. This proclamation is in honor of um, International Women's Day and the local Santa Maria Valley Women's March. Whereas March 8th is International Women's Day, a global day for celebrating the social, economic, cultural, and political achievements of women and whereas the vision of the Women's March of Santa Maria Valley is to strive to protect all human rights, protect the safety and health of all people through nonviolent means, work to unify the diverse peoples in the community, recognize the transformative changes are, are driven by grassroots actions and political activism. And whereas supporters of the Women's March of Santa Maria will march in solidarity on March 6, 2022, to advocate for the rights of women, people of color, those who are disabled, immigrants, and LGBTQ people, and ensuring healthcare, education, and justice for all. And whereas the mission of the Women's March of the Santa Maria Valley is to promote and celebrate the empowerment of all women in their communities. <clears throat> now, therefore, Alice Patino, Mayor of the City of Santa Maria, hereby recognizes March 6, 2022, as Women's March of Santa Maria Valley Day in the city of Santa Maria and encourages all residents and businesses to support the efforts of the Women's March of the Santa Maria Valley. Um, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that this year's Women March is going to be in honor of um, women who, who stood up and stepped into leadership during the pandemic and continue to do so and so um, I'm just so honored to be able to present this proclamation to um, Pam Gates and members of the Santa Maria Women's March Planning Committee. Thank you Mayor and Council members. Um, we appreciate your ongoing support. Sunday will be our fourth annual Women's March of Santa Maria Valley, and we're very excited to be doing it in person. So uh, I'd like to accept this on behalf of all the volunteers, the sponsors, the supporters, and the participants, and invite everyone to come out on Sunday. We'll be right outside in the park. Music starts at one, rally at two with speeches, and of course, the march at three. So I hope you can join us. It's important now and always that we make our voices heard and that we speak out for what we feel needs to be changed. Thank you. Thank you very much. I know, was it, with two, was it two years ago that it was out here? Was that three years ago now? Yeah. Oh my goodness. That was very, very nicely done. Thank you. Next, uh, and Mr. Watson, City Attorney, I want to ask you, because we're supposed to start the hearing 
on these maps as soon as we can to 530. So do we go to public comment and do we go to the um, yes, 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 con consent agenda? Okay. Okay, and then we can put that at the end of the meeting then. Okay, thank you. So next we'll have the public comment portion of the agenda. Madam Clerk, can you please read the criteria for the public comment portion of the agenda? This time is reserved to accept comments from the public on consent agenda items, closed session items, or matters not otherwise scheduled on the printed agenda this evening. Unless otherwise directed by the mayor, speakers will have three minutes to comment. Direction to staff may be given. However, state law does not allow action to be taken on matters not on the printed agenda this evening. But once the public comment period commences, no other speakers will be allowed uh, to submit a request to speak for them. Thank you. Madam Clerk, do we have any written comments or speakers this evening in the building or on the telephone? We have uh, two requests to speak um, here in the building. And uh, we may have callers online, uh, which I'll confirm after our speakers who are present. Speak. Okay, thank you. And that'll be three minutes. So we have Gary, Fall, Gary Hall followed by Hilda Cabal. Good evening, Mr. Hall. Good to see you somewhere besides Chambers. <laughs> My name is Gary Hall, and I know you can hear me. I'm a resident of Rancho Buena Vista um, Mobile Estates. I spent a fair amount of time trying to learn about the redistricting process. There's a lot to grasp. I did not devote the time needed to become proficient with the mapping tools. I have reviewed the three draft maps and accompanying demographics. Of the three, I favor the quadrant map. And I may not, am I not supposed to be speaking to that now, but I'm gonna go ahead. It seems far more logical and practical. Unrelated, but equally practical, would be the introduction in the near future of a mechanism or a provision that would allow the, all the council members the opportunity to place items of public interest on the city council meeting agenda of a future meeting. Brown Act requirements can easily be satisfied and the people's business, like mobile home rent stabilization, might actually be addressed. Many of us look forward to that day. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Hilda Cabal. Did I pronounce your name correctly? Yes. Oh, thank Cabal. you. Cabal, yes, thank you. Um, my name is Hilda Cabal, and I am the local leader for the 40 Days for Life campaign. Thank you for giving me this opportunity uh, to tell you about our life-saving efforts here in Santa Maria. Uh, 40 Days for Life is an um, internationally coordinated campaign that aims to end abortion locally through prayer and fasting, community outreach, and peaceful vigil in front of the abortion business like Planned Parenthood. Um, this spring, um, our Santa Maria campaign is one of the 588 cities that are participating. And, and locally, more than 100 people from Santa Maria have signed the Statement of Peace to stand vigil outside Planned Parenthood for 40 days as a loving, peaceful witness to the sanctity and dignity of life, the sanctity of the the child in the womb, and the dignity of the woman who carried the child. Our prayer volunteers are designed to, to have, of help, hope, and love that many women going to Planned Parenthood are praying for. The 6th uh, of March is going to be um, the March, a uh, women's march, and it's, it's a group of people who think that women only can succeed in life if they kill their children. That group is not a good representation of our Santa Maria community that is pro-life, pro-family, and pro-love. Abortion stops a beating heart and destroys a unique human being and hurt not only their mothers, but the entire families and communities. I invite you and everyone else here tonight to join our life-saving efforts. Come and join us our prayerful loving witness on the sidewalk 
Come and be a voice for the voiceless and come and open your Santa Maria heart to the women and of our community and help protect the youngest members of our community, the unborn children. You can find more information going to 40AsForLife.com. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Any written comments, Madam Clerk? Uh, Madam Mayor, by the way, we have no callers at this time, but yes, there was one written communication um, from Kyra Solis uh, recognizing the 2020 uh, to um, Santa Maria Valley Women's March, bringing women together and supporters from the Santa Maria Valley to celebrate International Women's Day and the rich diversity that makes up the Santa Maria Valley. Thank you. Before we go on, Mr. Stilwell, did you wish to make any comments Not at this time? Moving on to the consent calendar, Madam Clerk, would you please read item number three? Routine items are presented for City Council approval without discussion as a single agenda item in order to expedite the meeting. The consent calendar is approved by roll call vote with one motion. These items are discussed only on the request of council members. Okay, does anyone have items they wish to pull for discussion? I do not, and if the other council members do not, I'd like to uh, adopt the consent calendar as amended. Do I have a second? I'll second. I have a motion and a second to approve the consent calendar. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Madam Clerk, can you please call the roll? Councilmember Waterfield? Aye. Councilmember Cordero? Aye. Councilmember Escobedo? Aye. Councilmember Soto? Aye. Madam Mayor Patino? Aye. Next, we have a public hearing. Madam Clerk, to please read the title. The City Council will receive a presentation from National Demographics Corporation on draft maps. Consider input from the public pursuant to California Elections Code 10010 regarding draft maps, including communities of interest, and on the proposed boundaries of the electoral districts uh, for consideration. Thank you. Staff report in introductions be made by city manager, Mr. Stowell. Thank you, Madam Mayor and members of the council. So uh, this is where we're required uh, after the census to uh, update mm -hmm. our electoral district maps for the election of city okay. council members. Uh, we have had, or it's scheduled to have four public hearings uh, to solicit public comment in that process. We've held two uh, at the end of last year in the north part of town, we'll hold two this month in the south part of town, this one, and then a meeting on March 15th at the Marmonte Center. And so we're here tonight we, um, with three draft maps that our demographer Daniel Phillips presented, and we want to solicit comments, input on those draft maps or other um, potential maps that anyone else from the, comp from the public may have, and be able to receive some guidance from the council, whether we're on the right track or not, uh, so we can bring back a more refined map that meets the council and the public's interests on March 15th and at that point we would hope the council would be in a position to be able to introduce the map um, into um, with an ordinance and be able to adopt it at that first meeting in April and with that um, summary of the process I can turn it over to Daniel Phillips from NDC National Demographics Corporation to walk us through uh, the substance of the agenda item tonight. Thank you. Thank you Mr. Stovall. Madam Mayor and Council Members, uh, good to be with you again. As a reintroduction, I'm Daniel Phillips from National Demographics Corporation, and I'm back to guide you through this next stage of the process uh, for redistricting. So, if uh, we could uh, transition the uh, screen so that my slideshow is showing, thank you. So, uh, the first slide you'll see is a map of the city with the current district configuration. And I will uh, get into the current districts a little bit more, but first I want to talk about the timeline uh, for this process and, and uh, what has led to this point. So uh, initially we had two blue chap hearings uh, in August and September of last year. And these were held prior to the release of the draft plans. And the purpose of these hearings was to educate on the process as well as to solicit, solicit inputs on neighborhoods and communities of interest in the city. And at that point, I was able to give you 
estimated uh, data figures for your population, but in late September we had official census data come in. So I'll be able to uh, discuss that official census data with you tonight. So tonight is the first of the two post-draft hearings where the purpose is to present, discuss, and receive input on the draft plans, including any direction to revise the draft plans if, uh, if you see fit. So we'll have those hearings tonight and uh, March 13th. And then the plan will be adopted by a first and second readings of an ordinance, uh, the first reading to take place on March 15th and the second on April 5th. What you see here are the rules and goals for redistricting. The rules are those that come from federal and state law, and the goals are those that come from traditional principles that you may or may not want to consider. So the requirements are under federal law that the districts be equal in population. And when I refer to population, I am talking about all people counted by the census including children and non-citizens. So the idea is to have the districts be as equal as possible. Well, I should say not, uh, they don't have to be exactly equal. There is some wiggle room, and uh, I'll talk about that in a little later, but they should be substantially equal. Second is to adhere to the Federal Voting Rights Act by not diluting the, the voting influence of a protected class group of people under that legislation. And so, uh, in your city, the, the most prominent uh, protected class would be uh, Latinos or Hispanics. But on the flip side, we don't want to engage in what is called racial gerrymandering, where we make race or ethnicity the only our main consideration. So those are what come from federal law. And then under the next heading, you'll see the requirements as the state defines it. So you'll see here that it's actually a rank order of criteria, one, two, three, and four. That means that the state recognizes that it may not be possible to follow all of these criteria, in which case you would want to prioritize the ones that are higher on the list. So the very highest one is that the districts are geographically contiguous. That just means that they're one piece each, not uh, disconnected pieces with the exception of uh, city territory that is uh, located far outside in little islands. You gotta have that in some district, but th that's, that's uh, requirement number one. Number two is to uh, not divide neighborhoods and communities of interest. That latter term, communities of interest, refers to socioeconomic geographic areas that should be kept together. Number three is to have the districts have easily identifiable boundaries that, are, uh, that people can recognize and understand and, and easily uh, think about or describe. Number four is to have districts that are compact and that they do not bypass one group of people to get to a more distant group of people. You'll see at the very bottom, that there is a prohibition against favoring or discriminating against a political party. So the idea from the, from the state law is that this is to be a, a nonpartisan process, not, not considering where certain uh, political parties might be concentrated or not. So those are all the requirements. Now the final heading under other traditional redistricting principles are things that you may want to aspire to as a goal. Uh, so long as it is not at the expense of the federal and state criteria. So this includes minimizing voters shifted to different election years, uh, respecting voters' choices or continuity in office, accounting for future population growth, and preserving the core of existing districts. So let's talk about the current plan. You'll see here a map of the districts in their current configuration with the black boundaries. And you roughly have a Northwestern District 1, Northeastern District 2, Southwestern District 3, and Southeastern District 4. Although it's not a, a perfect quadrant system, but it's, uh, that's the, the rough configuration. So as the 
population stands now, there is a total population deviation of 18.6%. And the, the problem is that the courts have ruled that anything greater than 10% is, is constitutionally suspect as not being equal in population. So what you have here is that uh, particularly this, the northern districts are underpopulated while the southern districts are overpopulated because there's been more growth over the last 10 years in the south compared to the north. And so that has created this disparity of 18.6% between the most populated district and the least populated district. So the least populated district being District 1. Now we also want to consider how the current plan performs on the other criteria as well. When it comes to the Voting Rights Act, we don't really see any voting rights concerns with the districts as they are currently formulated. In fact, we have three districts with a majority Latino citizen voting age population, which is uh, very much in reflection of the, the total uh, city population. Now, we note that all districts are contiguous, which is in accordance with state law, except for, like I mentioned, the little islands out to the east or the west. And when it comes to neighborhoods or communities of interest, we have uh, received no testimony to this point that the districts divide neighborhoods or communities of interest, though that might change. And uh, to the contrary, actually, there has been agreement that the downtown area is actually not a community of interest in the sense that state law defines it, which is a socioeconomic area that is best represented by being in just one district. Rather, the consensus from the uh, pre-draft hearings is that it actually is better represented by multiple districts. And in fact, the, the council passed a motion that the, uh, the four districts should meet at the intersection of Maine and Broadway uh, to the extent possible. So that's how the current plan performs on that metric. Now, as far as these identifiable boundaries, it's, it's kind of an um, open question. They, are, they may not be so easily identifiable. They're not very straight in some places. They kind of, uh, they're kind of jagged, uh, but we'll, we'll discuss how the, how the proposed redistricting plans might address that. All districts do seem to be compact, uh, relatively. And finally, when it comes to uh, future growth, most future growth is expected to continue in those southern districts, three or four. But currently, District 1 is the most underpopulated at uh, minus 10%. So that brings us to the proposed redistricting plans that are on the table tonight. The first of which we call the minimal, minimal change plan A. And the reason we title that so is because it's, the idea is we want to, we're sticking very close to the districts as they currently are with the realization that the, 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 district, the current districts are, are perform pretty well on the criteria with the exception of the equal population requirement. So with minimal change plan A, we try to make the minimal changes to get to, to get the population deviation to an acceptable level. And here it is 5.3%, which is well under the threshold of 10%. So with this, redistricting plan, we see no appreciable difference from the current districts in terms of voting rights, contiguity, uh, neighborhood or COI or community of interest, integrity, or compactness. We actually, I would say, see a improvement in the boundaries being more easily identifiable since they are straighter in some places, such as Alon's uh, Sui Road. I, Am I pronouncing that right? Sway, sorry. I'm a Santa Barbara, so I don't uh, 
know quite the terminology, but I know how to pronounce still. <laughs> I used to say that it's still well, but I know it now. Okay, so sui is a consistent uh, boundary between, am I still not doing it right? Sway. Sway, sorry, okay. Yeah. I'll get it by the next year. So sway is a consistent boundary between two and four, uh, for the most part, and you have, uh, what you have here is, you see the current district boundaries in black, and the yellow boundaries are the, the ones for the proposed districts. And so what you see here is that because District 1 needs to gain population and District 3 needs to lose population, we just do a simple continuation of this line so that it continues along Jones Street east until it hits Broadway. So with, with this change, 4.7% of the city's population shift to a different district. And 4.4% uh, to one with a later election year. There is no difference from the current districts in terms of continuity of office or the core of each district. And under this plan, the most underpopulated district is District 3. And the reason I mention the most underpopulated district is one of the things you might consider is accounting for future population growth. And so in order to do that, the, probably the best way to do that would be to ensure that the most underpopulated district is the one where that growth is expected. Because there's some cushion for that population to catch up over the course of the decade. So that would be District 3 under this plan. So minimal change B, plan B, is very similar to plan A. It just takes a slightly different approach. What it does is rather than have the, the gain for District 1 be in this uh, little square between Jones and Main and Railroad and Broadway, Rather, District 1 expands to the southwest. And so what this plan accomplishes is you still have all four districts touching the intersection of Maine and Broadway. The result is a total population deviation of 3.3%, even, even smaller than with uh, minimal change plan A. But the Minimal change plan B is the same as minimal change plan A in the, in the other parts of the city with the Sway Road and uh, up here as well. So again, no appreciable difference in a lot of the criteria. The boundaries are a little straighter. And in this plan, 3.7% of the city's population would shift to a different district. 3.5% to one with a later election year. There is uh, no difference from the current districts in terms of continuity of office or the core of each district. And under this plan, the most underpopulated district is District 1. Daniel, I have a question for you. In our original district for District um, 1, what w it was underpopulated by how much? 10%. Okay, so this, this kind of brings it back together then. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So when it, when it comes to accounting for future growth, the idea is to have the district where that growth is expected to be slightly underpopulated, but you can't have it be drastically right. underpopulated or else we risk having the total population deviation be greater than 10%, which would mean the plan is not population balanced. Okay, so plan... B fixes District 1 then to make it more equally populated. Yeah, all the plans fix okay. the districts in that okay. sense. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. So that leads us to the final plan under consideration tonight, and that is what I'm calling the Quadrant Plan. And this is more of a moderate change, but one that you might uh, there might be a uh, good justification for, depending on your uh, point of view. And what this 
What this plan does is have uh, each district adhering to one quadrant of the city based on Main Street and Broadway. So District 1 is completely and entirely north of Main and west of Broadway. District 2 is north of Main and east of Broadway. District 3 is south of Main and west of Broadway. And District 4 is south of Main and east of Broadway. Though it does extend west uh, toward the airport area uh, for population purposes. So it doesn't w work out quite uh, perfectly where you have all four quadrants being equal in population, but this is, this is pretty clean. And you do have a total population deviation of 6.2%, which again is well under the 10% threshold. So when it comes to the Voting Rights Act, we still have three districts with the majority Latino citizen voting age population, but the percentage in different districts do fluctuate. There is no difference from the current districts in terms of contiguity or uh, neighborhood or community of interest integrity, as far as we can tell. And the boundaries are much more easily identifiable since they are very straight and follow the major arteries, which also serves to make the districts more compact. So the, the consequence of doing this moderate change quadrant plan is that a full quarter of the city's population would shift to a different district. 3.8% uh, to one with an earlier election year, and 8.0% to one with a later election, and then the remainder would go to a district with the same election year. There would be no difference from the current districts in terms of continuity of office or the core of each district. And under this plan, the most underpopulated district is District 2 in the Northeast, just uh, about 3%. So that leads me to my final slide, which is just to prompt any questions about you might have about the proposed redistricting plans. And here, if you might have a preference at this point, this is also the, the time to express any revisions you might want to see or, or maybe an entirely different plan that I might not have thought of that you would like to bring back at the next hearing. And finally, there is a link here to the interactive review map, which I would be happy to, to uh, visit for you so that at, with that platform, you can actually zoom in and and look at the finer details of the boundaries for the districts under each plan. So thank you for your attention and happy to take your questions. Thank you, Mr. Phillips. Are there any questions from the council? Okay, I have a question. For some reason, my eyes just aren't working that well. The minimal change in plan A and plan B is the 5.3% versus, uh, and the deviation of population, versus the 3.3%. So it's just, you're just carving out a tiny bit more from, dist from each district to make up for the population. And so plan A, the, and I believe you said that the deviation of 5.3 is, is a good number, but the deviation of 3.3 .3 would be a better number if you want to stick to the, you know, the rules a little bit tighter. Correct, yeah. So all else being equal, you would probably want to prefer a lower deviation. Right. But there are other factors to consider as well. And really anything that's less than 10 is considered equal population. Okay, and it keeps every other category tight as well. As far as uh, the minimal change plans? Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, so really the only the, real, the difference between minimal change plan A and plan B is that with plan B, you, you get all four districts touching downtown. Okay. With uh, plan A, district one would have all of western downtown. Okay. And district three would not include part of downtown. Thank you. Mike, do you have any questions? Mr. Cordero? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I, uh, 
I've spent a, a lot of time looking, looking at this and, and going back in history, and uh, I, I see this as really important because it's going to influence us for 10 years. And I, I don't remember the, the last time we did it didn't seem to affect me quite as much. I, I, I was just kind of, yeah, well, that's what everybody wants. I was just kind of into it, you know. But, but this time it just seemed to be um, so much more important. And I'll do it a little bit more succinct than you did. I don't, I don't care much for plan A uh, because it, it cuts out the, the District 3's touching of Main and Broadway. I just don't care for that, even though I personally don't necessarily place the, the high value level on that because my vote doesn't change. Uh, my vote is equally important whether I like the spot there or any place else in the city. So I, I, I don't place the ownership of having to have all four um, districts intercept at Main Broadway. I don't have that value, but I do respect everyone else's right to want to do that. So for that reason and that reason alone, I, I, don't, I don't adhere to plan A. Which takes me to plan B, um, which makes a little bit more sense. And that's, I was actually leaning in that direction. <clears throat> However, I'm gonna wait until we have the next meeting and, and find out more about what others might want to say. But then I spoke with someone else, and the communities or neighborhoods of interest came up, and I, I don't think that I placed quite the value on that that, that perhaps should be placed on it. And so then I looked at the quadrant map. Uh, and when I think your words were, it's cleaner, it's more defined, it's simpler, and that's pretty much the same dialogue I got from the people I talked to, saying that this is just simpler. And then looking back in history, back in the 1800s, four men came along, I think uh, Miller, Thornburg, uh, Cook. Cook, and... Fessler, Fessler. Yeah, that guy, Fessler. And, and, and they donated the land that was centered at Main and Broadway, that was the, where, where all the properties intersected. And I don't, obviously they didn't have any idea that in 2022 we would be looking at this, but, but quad, uh, the quad map, the third one you talked about, that, um, unintended so, but that takes into consideration going back to the 1700s about how that was originally planned out for us, uh, in, in those of us that were, the people that were in the city at that time, I think they're all gone now. Uh, but, uh, so I, I, I'm going to anxiously wait for more input from people that might come to the next meeting. And I would certainly take this opportunity to encourage others to come to the next meeting and participate. But I, I'm torn between uh, B and the quadrant plan, but the quadrant plan is, as you said and others have told me, much cleaner and simpler to understand, and it puts probably the right value on the communities of interest in, in, within the city limits. Um, I, I have kind of a different take on that. I kind of think that if you start mixing the communities up, we'll all learn to understand and appreciate some of the values that other community members have. But then um, some people that are close to me kind of convinced me that, that maybe we should take a, a harder look at what we're calling communities of like interest. So, so I'm leaning in the others and I'm personally at this point in time uh, kind of discarding uh, plan A and, and dealing with uh, the quadrant plan and uh, and plan B. Does that make sense? Thank you, yeah. Okay. Ms. Soto? Thank you. Um, it's not so much a question, but more of a like affirmation, I guess, is um, 
my understanding of the reason why the laws allow for there to be less than a 10% deviation is because there is no such thing as a perfect map. And in order for jurisdictions or local agencies to be able to select the best map that's most appropriate for their community, um, it may mean just that, that there won't be a perfect map. And that's why they, there is wiggle room or flexibility for deviation, correct? And so anything under 10% is still essentially um, an acceptable and good map. Yes, that's correct. The, the intent of giving, providing for that wiggle room is so that you can take in, into account other criteria like compactness and easily identifiable boundaries and communities of interest, et cetera. Thank you. Any else? Mr. Mr. Phillips, this is just <clears throat> hypothetical. What if we did nothing, just stay with what we, were, what we are right now? I believe you would be sued for um, <laughs> okay. being uh, uh, not in compliance with federal law. Okay, so it has to be under that 10% variation. Yeah. Okay. I, I have a question. When you do these maps, do you look at the growth of Santa Maria with what is pending as far as housing developments that are going on right now? Because we have, um, we have the Aquish Apache development, which would be in three. We have the Bed Arabia Dan Blau development, which is a lot of housing in three. And then we're also looking at A Street. And we're, we're talking 20, I'll, I'll just do a, a low number of 2,000 homes. Yeah, yeah, so. Future population growth is is one of those uh, optional considerations, yeah. and it's up to you as far as the extent to which you want to emphasize that. And so, your only your only obligation is to the 2020 data. And eventually, in 2030, you will go through this process again, and any future developments will be accounted for in that process. But if you want to kind of uh, if you, kind of, if you want to kind of uh, account for that in an advanced way, you can do that by slightly underpopulating the district where that growth is expected. And so if you say District 3 is where that growth is expected, minimal, plan, minimal change plan A makes District 3 the most underpopulated district at minus 3%. So, uh, to the extent that you want to prioritize that, and again, it, it can't be at the expense of the, the federal and state criteria, then maybe that plan would be your best bet. But with, uh, with the other plans, District 1 is the most underpopulated at about minus 2. And with Quadrant Plan, it's, it's about minus 3% in, in District 2. So then would you redraw the lines um, now to show uh, that, would you put more population in District 1 because of the incoming population of District 3? So we're, we're talking here about just slight deviations. We, we can't do anything substantial because that would take us too far away from the 2020 data that you're obligated to adhere to. And so the, the idea is since uh, you're expecting more people to come in over the course of a decade in, in probably the, the southern part of the city, am I correct in saying that? Mm -hmm. Then you would, if you want to make this a consideration, you would want to have those be more underpopulated to give those a cushion to catch up. But if you're under no requirement to do that, because that will be taken into account in 2030. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the county? Council? No? Okay. 
So I'll open this up for a public hearing. Madam Clerk, do we have written correspondence or requests to speak? Uh, Madam Mayor, uh, before we move on, it looks like Council Member Escobedo. Oh, that's um, right. I forgot about it. Has his hand up now? <laughs> Go ahead. Hello, everybody. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. I almost awesome. forgot about you, Mr. Escobedo. No, no, no worries. I, I, I'm here. Uh, I'm, I'm looking into uh, the, the maps, and um, I see that uh, the that plan A and B get the not different from current districts in terms of infinity and office of, sorry, the, uh, uh, oh yeah, uh, not appreciable difference from the current district in terms of voting rights and to the neighborhoods uh, and the community uh, interest in triggering. So, so basically this is saying that either, uh, plan, plan A and plan B, they keep the community of uh, interest uh, is that is that right? So there, there is no appreciable difference between the current plan and the minimal change plans as far as uh, communities of interest are concerned. To the extent that we have not received uh, any testimony or, or evidence to that effect. So it would be uh, safe to say that either one of those two plans. Um, basically uh, protect the community of interest. As far as we understand it, because we haven't received testimony saying that the the current districts are dividing a certain neighborhood or our community of interest. Okay. Um, okay. Perfect. Uh, yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, by, oh, sorry, I uh, just got uh, one comment in regards sure. to uh, apologies, Mr. Mayor. Uh, in regards to downtown, uh, I think it's, uh, you know, we, we talk about it and uh, I do agree with uh, Mr. Corden in regards, uh, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, we all care about downtown. I mean, even we were elected by a district, but we represent the whole city of Santa Maria. Either if, uh, you know, if somebody approached uh, to, to the mayor, to the, to, uh, Council member uh, Cordero or, or uh, Soto or Ada, everybody, you know, we don't we don't ask what these could they come from. So I think it's uh, just uh, you know downtown is, is great, and um, and I think it's uh, it's important, but but yeah, just uh, just I don't see that we need to. I say. Uh, um, I mean, I, it's important, but it, it, from my point of view, I um, mean, Broadway and Main Street, they're the principal uh, ways, but uh, that they shouldn't determine exactly how we can have, how we're divided. I mean, but, yeah, just want to throw that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'll open up the public hearing now. Bamford, do we have written correspondence or requests to speak? Yes, um, Madam Mayor, we do have some written communication. Actually, we have two uh, from David Dennis and Kathy Sherum in support of the quadrant map, commenting that it was the most practical way to divide Santa Maria and make it easy for voters to know who their representative is and that Broadway and Main Street make clearly uh, understood boundaries for districts. And. Um, with that, Mayor, Madam Mayor, we have uh, four um, requests to speak in um, the building, and we'll confirm if we have any call callers when we're finished. Thank okay. you. Okay. Peggy Brighton, followed by Rebecca Garcia, followed by Luanda, and jo Giovanni Medina. Ms. Briarton. Okay, maybe just slide it, yeah. Good evening, Mayor and um, audience and staff. Um, I support the Quadrant Plan. And it's, it just seems logical, it's easy to understand, it serves the community better because 
we know our districts, not zigzagging through communities. I mean, that just doesn't make sense to me. So uh, I support the quadrant plan. Thank you. Thank you. Rebecca Garcia, followed by LaWanda Lyons Pruitt. Good evening. Um, Yes, hello. I also will keep my comment pretty short. I also wanted to demonstrate support for the Quadrant Plan. Um, I noticed that one of the considerations under the second category, sorry, I'm visually seeing the second category, um, is that when voters are placed into a new district, that can be confusing. Um, but I really like the Quadrant Plan for that reason. Even when voters are moved, it's really easy to understand you know, where you're going to be. Um, I luckily just got to walk here to this meeting, so I love when you have your meetings here. Um, but you know, I can see exactly based off Broadway and Maine what district um, I would be in just looking at that map. And so, really love that, and it makes it accessible for anyone. So, thank you. Thank you. Luanda Lyons. Hello, Luanda. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Madam Mayor. Council members, Lawanda Lyons Pruitt, representing the Santa Maria Lompoc branch of the NAACP. I'm a resident of Santa Maria, been here since 1973, with the exception of two years at Cal State Long Beach, and then coming back, um, marrying my husband, who was in the military. We lived at Vandenberg uh, Air Force Base, now Space Force Base, for a brief period of time. Purchased our home in Santa Maria on the uh, northwest side of town in 84. Was there for five years. The market went up. And then we purchased our house on the northeast side of town in 1989. Uh, we're right at Sui. <laughs> Uh, we're right at Sway, and actually, our home was the last development in Santa Maria. Merrill Gardens was the riding stable, and that was it. Um, I have family here in Santa Maria. They're scattered. My daughter has a condo, an orchid. However, she's home with me because her condo flooded in August, and we're still waiting to get it fixed. Um, having just the three maps versus the 100, over 100 plus with the county redistricting process certainly makes this easy. Also, having the quadrant map makes it easy. Um, I think that it easily identifies, I'm really into Maine and Broadway, by the way. Uh, I know you probably don't remember, but when we did the first redistricting, that was a big thing for us, was Maine and Broadway dividing um, Santa Maria. Um, it's easily identifiable. Um, it's the most practical way to divide Santa Maria, geographically contiguous, and uh, it makes it easy for voters to know who their representative is. And I certainly don't want to be looking over on SUI and trying to figure out who my representative is. So uh, for all those reasons, uh, we support the quadrant map. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Giovanni Medina. Hello, good evening, members good evening. of good evening, members of the council. I will also keep my comments short. I don't have much to say. Um, as somebody else who is also um, experiencing the redistricting process for the first time, who's really trying to understand it, I'm also here to try to show support for the quadrant map, which is something that I thought was super easy to understand. Um, I thought that's something super necessary for our community, especially our community of voters, something that is accessible and something that is easy to understand. I think this is going to encourage folks to vote just because right now something that they struggle with is inaccessibility. Um, specifically here with our council, um, there's no Spanish translation here, regardless of most of the majority of our community members being Spanish speaking members. Um, there's usually just like a lack of accessibility. And so I think a good first step towards that was making our map accessible. So I think the quadrant plan would be a really good first step. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Yeah. 
Okay. I just wanted to double check and confirm we have no callers. Okay. Madam okay. Mayor, that's it. Okay. So I'll close the public hearing, bring this item back to council and discussion or guidance for staff. Madam Mayor, I think we just come back next okay. time and make our decisions. Uh, Madam Thank Mayor, you. I kind of think that we should wait, of course, until yes. until the uh, the following meeting. And once again, I would stress to any of the listening public that I hope others uh, find the time to get involved and uh, and come forward and support one or the other <clears throat> or any other. I understand there's a method that they can go on to the internet and draw their own map. Uh, so is that right, Jason? Yeah. yeah. So so. Uh, it's, it's a, a pretty transparent process that we're trying to go through here, and it's something that you as residents are going to live with for the next 10 years. So I think the more participation, the better the decision will be. I sort of thought we would have people introducing maps tonight. I thought maybe we would probably have maybe three or four coming forward. Yes, Mr. When, yes, thank you. When's the last day that folks can submit community drawn maps? Or pro can propose maps? <clears throat> so, so uh, tonight would be the the time to make your opinions know, known if you would like to see revisions made to any of the current or any of the plans that are under consideration tonight. Uh, or to suggest a completely new idea. And the, the reason is we would need to have time to uh, process and post and properly notice the, uh, any re revisions before the next hearing. Although I, I think I, if, uh, if members of the public were to go onto the redistricting webpage, there's a there's a place there that they can submit a, a comment, and perhaps there they could give a written description saying, I would like a map that does this or that. And if we receive that, I think in the next week or so, that, that would still give me enough time to, to uh, process and post that map, because there is technically no legal requirement that the, uh, Actually, the, the, the final deadline for the maps to be posted is seven days in advance of when it is adopted. The question is, does that mean uh, the, the first reading or the second reading? So just to be safe, it's probably best to have it uh, seven days before the, the next hearing when the, the first reading is scheduled. So given that the next hearing is going to be uh, March 15th, so uh, the 8th would be a, a good time to uh, get those in. Mr. Cordero. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Mr. Phillips, would you have the data on population of the four districts, the, po the, the residential population available at hand? Yes, that, that information is available on the redistricting webpage, but I can also pull it up for you now if we, just depending on which plan you'd like me to. The quadrant. To. Okay, so the quadrant plan. And uh, what particular data would you like? I, I'd like to know that just the uh, population of each one of the communities, or each one of the quadrants. Sure. Yeah, it's going to take better eyes than this. I, can, I, I have it here. Yeah, we got it here in front of us on our computer. Okay, I don't. I'll read it out. Okay. So it's, um, I think it'll be easier if I just give the uh, population uh, percent deviations uh, because uh, the ideal population is going to be the same for all four. It's just a matter of how much they deviate from that ideal. So District 1 is 3.4% overpopulated. District 2 is 
7% underpopulated. District 3 is 0.2% overpopulated. And District 4 is minus 0.9% underpopulated. Thank, thank you, sir. Uh, uh, sorry, can, can you repeat uh, district? But I'm trying to find the, uh, the numbers on, on my computer, but uh, for district, what is 3.4? And for the fourth, what, what was it? District 4 is minus 0 0.9%. Any other questions? Okay, so I guess that's it until next time. And, and I guess if anyone is, um, is interested in, in uh, introducing a map, they can do that just by going on the website, right? Okay. One week before the uh, next uh, meeting, right? Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. So I will close the public hearing. Um, and that's all the public comment we have. The next item will be a report by City Manager, Mr. Stilwell. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the Council. I have uh, two reports tonight, uh, brief. Uh, one is the next meeting of the City Council is March 15th. That will um, be begin um, not at City Hall. That will be scheduled to be at the Marmonte Center, the Marmonte Community Center, 6th. 20 East Sunrise Drive, and the main item for that agenda will be the redistricting with the city's chosen map selection ordinance first reading. Also, we have two other required agenda items on that day, the general plan annual report and the measure you committee annual report, which should be short items. Second, I'd like to up, um, mention there's an exciting opportunity for a micro business grant the opportunity starts on March 7th, and we have Glenn Morris, the president of our Chamber of Commerce, to tell, tell us about that. Oh, good evening, Mr. Morris. Good evening, Mayor, members of the council. Um, as Mr. Stillwell mentioned, uh, the state of California has introduced another um, COVID relief grant program. This, in this iteration, uh, is targeting micro businesses. Um, under this program, the county of Santa Barbara has been granted about a half a million dollars. Uh, to distribute to these micro businesses uh, in grants of up to $2,500 each. Uh, the uh, Santa Barbara Foundation is going to manage the application process and facilitate folks getting you know, through their system. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce, um, actually all of the chambers in the county uh, have been um, asked to facilitate outreach uh, to this community. Uh, we are looking for uh, 80 to 90 of them based on population uh, from the, this area. Um, so when we talk about micro businesses, what do we mean? And, and they, re they really mean micro businesses. These are businesses that in 2019, prior to COVID, um, had total revenues um, not exceeding $50,000. Um, so these are folks that are, that are really uh, very small businesses uh, in our community. And as you would expect, there's a priority in really trying to reach out to underserved communities or underrepresented communities that may not have participated uh, or had opportunity to participate in prior grant programs uh, of this nature. Um, so, you know, as you think about who might be, uh, you know, the types of people or businesses that might be in that range, you know, we're, we're possibly talking about farmers market vendors or um, maybe a lawn care um, service or, you know, a, an individual who does child care in their home or, um, you know, does uh, beauty treatments in their home. Um, these are very small businesses and they're going to be a little challenging for us to find because they're not the type of businesses that would normally be engaged in community organizations. So we really need the support of, of the council, but we really need the support of our community in spreading the word about this opportunity and making sure that the people that it's designed for know about it and understand um, you know, that, that, that there's money here available for them. Uh, if, if you know folks that fit that category, have them reach out to us at the chamber. Uh, we'll connect with them and, and, and help them you know, work their way through, the, through that process. Um, the application form um, it goes live next week. 
Um, the good news is we've got until like November to, to complete this one. So we have some time, which will be helpful because we really think that the outreach on this is going to be person to person, friend to friend, neighbor to neighbor. Glenn, do these businesses have to have business license? I, I don't believe so. Um, yeah, I don't believe so. They, they will have to have some documentation that, that demonstrates, you know, that level of income and that that income comes from a business activity, not necessarily a wage, right? So, so then, but that's the foundation's job is to help them figure out what kind of paperwork they qualifies them. Is this just for existing businesses or? A startup so, business. Yeah, so they had to have been operational in 2019 yeah. because this is to um, mitigate the impacts of the COVID pandemic. So these will be businesses that were operating in 2019, were impacted over the last two years, and either are still operating or have a viable plan to get back to operation with some support. So I assume they would have to have tax returns to show that they were in business. Uh, tax returns or bank documents or something of that nature yeah so that's a fifty thousand dollars or less yeah okay yeah I, I thought it was a little bit amusing the state also has a requirement that says no more than five employees uh, if they're making less than if they're grossing less than fifty thousand dollars i'm not sure how they have any employees but perhaps right so those are the two criteria so appreciate any support we can get in in spreading the word on this uh, we do have a little bit of time which is helpful um, but we do want to make sure that this is getting out um, throughout our community um, and, and uh, to you know as many people as we can possibly um, connect the, the, the dots to. Countywide, I think uh, there's funding for up somewhere between 170 and 100, uh, 200 people that are businesses to get these grants. So thank you, Mayor. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Next item is oral reports of council members. And let's see, Ms. Sarah, should we start with you? Sure. Um, no reportable item, but I do have something fun to share. Um, today, I read to a second grade class at Oakley Elementary School, and it was the highlight of my day. Um, and then another point that I'd like to make is that I would really, really like for us to put on the agenda rent stabilization for mobile home parks. Thank you. Ms. Waterfield. None. And Mr. Cordero. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, after the last meeting, I attended the radio show for Ben Hayes. Uh, then I had a meeting with the uh, United Way concerning our Queen candidate. <clears throat> I was um, excited to, uh, on the 24th, to meet with the uh, uh, people at the library regarding Black History Month. Uh, that was an exciting group of people. There was some uh, dancing and music and stuff, and, and Luanda did a great job of uh, bringing that together. And then on the 25th, uh, I read the proclamation for uh, Pastor Julius Alton Ford, who passed away. Uh, and it was, this was an amazing individual in our community that, that, that we lost. He was a member, I believe, uh, uh, pastored a church here in town for 52 years. And uh, they were just people from all over the country here to speak uh, on his behalf and what a, what a great influence he had on so many people in the community. And just like Ms. Uh, Soto, I read today at uh, Read Across America, I read to three classes. Uh, my wife and I both did, and it's always exciting to, to see the eyes of these young children uh, light up and, 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 uh, and reading to them. And I get a lot more hands go up <clears throat> when you read to them now, and I, I usually ask how many kids are going to college. And when I first started doing this back in the 70s, uh, it seemed like maybe two or three hands that go up. And now the entire class goes up. So uh, I don't know exactly what the district's doing, but they're doing something to increase the interest in further education. And uh, that would be it for me. Thank you very much, Mayor. Thank you. Mr. Escobedo? Yes. Hello. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, 
last uh, February the 19th, I attended the Black History Month collaboration, as uh, Ms. Mr. Cordero mentioned. It was a really, really well organized event. Uh, it just, uh, it was, it was great. So, uh, yeah. thank you, Lawana, for, for for putting that together, and um, the city staff, the public library, they were, they were great. And yeah, that's that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, see, February fifteenth, I did the Ben Hayes KUHL news uh, meeting, uh, radio on the morning. February sixteenth, I did the CCCE policy board of directors meeting. Later that day, I took the Santa Monica Valley Country at the Country Club did the housing summit, um, and on the seventeenth, I attended APCD board special meeting and the SB CAG monthly board meeting. And on February 19th, I attended Livable California teleconference. On the 23rd, Marion Foundation Board of Directors meeting, and also went to the cemetery for the Korean veteran remains that were brought home and laid to rest in our cemetery here in Santa Maria. Uh, February 24th, I attended the Boys and Girls Club back at Youth Night. And my youth was Veronica Gonzalez, and a real bubbly little 10-year-old. And um, her favorite kind of food is Chinese food, and that worked well because Panda Express did the catering that night. Uh, March 1st, I did the KUHL, the Ben Hay Show. And then this morning, I did a, a real in-depth tour of our riverbed and looking at some of the homeless population and their encampments. And I guess that is it. Any, anything else? You know, tonight I would like to close this meeting in honor of a man that has done a lot in our valley, Dan Blau. And uh, he has contributed so much to the way Santa Maria looks and the Santa Maria Valley looks. And it's, it's really different when you have a man or a, per, a woman that does developing in the area that they live and they have a vested interest that it looks good. Uh, quite often we've seen things by out of town developers and they want to come in, make money and they're gone and then sometimes you're left with the mistakes. But with Dan it was, um, it was always something he was proud of. You could trust him, you could trust his word. And, and now he's gone, and, and I think this valley has really lost someone that's really important. A lot of times we don't look, realize that we lose an important person until after they're gone, but Dan Blau is going to be missed by all of us. So thank you very much. Meeting is adjourned. Mm -hmm.